Here we go. So now, now you see me in all my glory in my office here. So the, the idea, ooh, I think I've also lost my boxes. So let me get back over here. All right. So the secret to scale, therefore, is to build a fundamentally a character of the location. And one of the easiest way to do this is to take your adventure games mechanism, whether it be Dungeons and Dragons or a, as I usually play Nikos RPG, and you build a character sheet that is that community. At first you go, that's strange. Why would you do that? You know, there's a lot of different individuals within the town. But check this out. If you consider the scale up and you say, okay, I'm looking at the town as a, as a personality. When you talk about, for example, its strengths, that would be uh, indicative of perhaps its military or its police force or just simple its local security. These values that, that we see as numeric for a persona can also apply to a community if you look at it in a, with a different set of eyes, which is fundamentally what scaling is. You're just moving up the scale to see things in a different light. So therefore, a quick version of building a uh, building a village would be to build a character sheet. What did they have? What did they have for strength? What is their when you speak of their constitution? How stable is the community? Is it is it stoic and going to be there for a long time, or is it fragile? Maybe there's factionalization that's going on, and so therefore, a low constitution score would reflect the fact that maybe the town isn't going to be able to hold its position or perhaps defend itself culturally. This is particularly important if you're dealing with one village or one town in juxtaposition to say a larger city that might be nearby. If you look at the role of the village or the town as an impact on the players, then these th numbers start to make sense. If you're looking at for example, a, uh, say an agility number. I don't want to always stick just to uh, standard Dungeons and Dragons, but I want to talk about it in a, perhaps a wider scale. You're going to want to consider the agility of the town. How quickly can it respond? Does it have people who are you know, quick to be there? Do they act uh, to assist people in an in a timely fashion or are they perhaps a little more stoic and sluggardly and they don't respond as quickly maybe they're um, in terms of charisma we could be talking about the beautification projects that are going on in the city is it a, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a village or a city of pretty people we might be talking about an ogre village but the idea here is does it make sense is it aesthetically pleasing is it does it make sense? A, a, a village or a town that has a low charisma might simply not be someplace you'd want to spend much time in. Uh, this, in other games, for example, is uh, represented in uh, the game Civilization with the idea of beautification projects and uh, locations of value. You know, if you're talking about a high charisma locale, maybe it's got some really jaw-dropping uh, beautiful scenery maybe it's uh, particularly daunting architecture these numbers because they are of the character sheet they don't have to mean don't have to carry the same meaning but they do give a way to convey the information rapidly so that you can create a town fundamentally on the fly by simply writing down on the persona sheet or the character sheet the the uh, the grace with which a city responds. Uh, maybe you, you could look at it from the standpoint of wisdom. Is it a place where there are people who are clever and wise and willing to share the information? Or are they maybe not good planners? These are all things that reflect because of the numeric value. If it's a place of high intellect, if it's got a, a moderately high brilliance score or whatever then this means that the place is going to be 
full of novelty and ingenuity and by simply looking at the numbers for the person for the town as a character you're actually able to build and you even heard it said in, in common usage you'll talk about the, the community's character or the the feel of a location and we can convey that through the numbers of scale note this goes up scale as well you go to a kingdom or a realm or even a nation and look at those numbers and you'll see that even within a larger community you might have smaller communities that have a lower series of the numbers or maybe they're one one area is a bright spot in an otherwise dull community there's ways to 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 see this so that you don't have to spend a lot of time building out locales and trying to rack your brain on what would make something appealing to the players when you can simply make it so that they interact with the community as if it was a person it doesn't mean they're going to talk to a town that's of course silly but they perhaps will have an idea of what they want to get their minds into oh there we go yeah there you go d20 for each that makes sense and that means you can get some really high and low numbers okay so dex uh i would consider that to be the the town's uh response time its ability to interact so do they have a do they have a, a village guard that is constantly on duty uh, in, an, in an earlier exchange, we were talking about whether or not a village would have 20 guards on site. But if, they had a, if the village had a high agility, maybe that means they have a really strong volunteer police department. Maybe it means that there are firefighters within blocks. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can show this agility. You could also technically do it with a very town's movement itself. Um, I'm reminded of a movie that came out recently that by itself was not really particularly uh, extensively uh, appreciated, but the movie Mortal Engines had towns that actually drove around. So maybe your town is uh, nomadic, and so the people get up and move. The idea of a very high dexterity might actually mean that they're, instead of finding yourself in a established locale, you could almost think of it almost like the equivalent of an ancient Gobekli Tepe where you have a static location that the travelers come to and therefore it's a, a town by definition but it's not established and it and they can respond to it so if there was a you know a forest fire perhaps the agility means they have a better chance of survivability maybe they have a high response time because there are military forces that are near them that are going to be problematic going through the other numbers let's see we talked about yeah we pretty much talked about all of them the idea of the appearance of the town the uh, depth of character of the town these are all things that you can take right from a character sheet as uh, strictly mentions the one that he's been working on so uh, village with wait yeah, there you go. There you go. You put it on an island that moves, or it could be, maybe it's airborne. Maybe the entire village or city is a sky city. There's a possibility there that would give it an extremely high potential agility, or it could even be as in, uh, in Mortal Engines. Again, there's a reference to uh, a community that is kept aloft because they're all airships and they've all linked together in in the. Uh, atmosphere and therefore hold the city up by the very vessels that they travel in these are all ways to do that so this idea of using a character sheet to adjust your story that you move up and down scale especially in light of the next secret that we have here which is drum roll please Maps and navigation. Now, I did, I've done a bit of this in the uh, uh, early started but never completed, which is also typical for me. The idea of the uh, a, a world in around 80 days. The idea here is you begin your navigation and your mapping 
with the simplest of nav of map navigation. We all know north, south, east, west. We all know left, right, up, down. So by utilizing just those simple terms and building a map not of physical locale, but of perceptual locale, you're able to get a quicker idea of what's going on within the game. Now, in a world like Nikos, in the adventure world that I've created, the map, the entire world has been mapped out and literally you can go in any direction and there's something going on. But that's because I've been doing it for 50 years. A, a person who is starting out, maybe he only has the one village he wanted to start his players with and that's where we're, we're beginning at. Well, that's great. But even to the mapping there can be as simple as north, south, east, west. And this is also to the left, to the right. So. For example, if you're going to start in a small village, you've got your character sheet that you've used to develop what you have as far as the culture, you know they're going to have a police force that's going to be of some strength. Let's say you've got a moderately strong community. That means there's probably going to be a garrison or at least some place that the authorities will gather and therefore you know you've got to have a, a central facility for that. You therefore have to determine is that right next to the bar or is it down the street? Is it going to take some time? And by simply mapping out three or four locations off of your center point, as a matter of fact, I recommend north, south, east, west, and less than 10 minutes as your first initial map. You just want to be able to reach out and touch these locations for your players to be able to put their feet down and push against the universe, so to speak. When you are building a role-playing game, it really is important that the players feel like they're part of the community. And the best way to do that is make it so that they can, as quickly as possible, familiarize themselves with the layout. So by, say, five locations in a small village, you've got your center of town, you've got your police force, you've got your merchants, and you've got your religious orders there's five there's four locations right from wherever we're standing and you just describe where they are the players will do the rest the players will by their own nature want to learn how to navigate how far things are away how quickly they can get there and i don't recommend a huge amount of effort put into mapping and creating although that's where i started and if you want to you want to get down to it when you've started game mastering back in the olden days when I was a youngster, um, you did the map first. You built out the extensive layout of wherever location and normally it was an underground dungeon because that's where the game concepts came from. But then you would describe where the players would go within that structure. Well, the same thing's true in a larger scale map, but you don't have to draw it out or anything at the beginning because the players are going to be gravitating towards locales based on their choices and then you're just playing into it by scrolling the map if they go left then you've got to describe another place even further left if they go they go north then you've got to go some space there's something beyond the north and this can be as simple as no there isn't as far as you go north that there's a cliff there that's it sure you now uh, you know in the case of Westeros and Game of Thrones. Everybody knows that the wall represented the farthest north you could go. There were places beyond the north, and we certainly get there in the story, but when you describe it initially, you know that there is the wall and there is nothing beyond that. That's where the story goes. And by limiting where the players go, you only give yourself an opportunity to funnel them or direct them to the parts of the story you want to get to. The next part is navigation. And I've lumped these two together because navigation is really what it comes down to is how they travel. And I set for myself a guide of, pardon me, utilizing hex mapping. And the idea of a hex map for me was an easier way of visualizing, but that's of course given when I started. Today, players may not be as familiar with that. There's plenty of great software out there they can use to create much more dynamic and dioramic map areas, even coming down to every single tree if you really wanted to get to that microcosmic level. 
But the idea is that you utilize what you have to work with first, and as you become more uh, proficient at it, then you can become more detailed. And more importantly, what I found really handy is I had my players do the mapping uh, at first. And by having the players do the map, then I could, as the oversight, look at what they had created and go, oh yes, you got that right. Or, oh, you put those two, those two, close, to get, two close together, so that's the farther distance. But it's a matter of your description and their skills, and therefore you take some of that burden off of yourself. So just realize that the very navigation Okay, so uh, going going back, I see I've got a question here. So you're, you're uh, okay. Here we go. Okay, so is wisdom magic? No, that's up to you because strength might be magic. It it could be how much of a magical effect. It really depends on where you scale your adventure, if you consider your games to be high fantasy, then probably magic is a great component of their strength. But it could also be of their intellect or even of their wisdom, depending on you. I, I tend to use wisdom to represent moral authority. So uh, clerical organizations, uh, religious cults, those kind of things for my wisdom score. But you could use any of them. Didn't mean to switch, switch gears on us, but so I guess it also plays somewhat in the navigation because if you have a very strong community, you perceive of it as having walls and boundaries. But if you're playing in a high fantasy with lots of mystical magics, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you've got enough uh, magical defenses to hold in that form. So these numbers that you build for the character, although I'm giving recommendations the way I would do it, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the way you, that you will want to do it. You may find ways that work better for you. So, now, the final piece about navigation. I set a given travel distance by actually doing some real life, real time research, and that's finding out how far a person can walk in a day versus how far a horse can carry a man in a day if he's dedicated to the travel. And of course, assuming, quote, good roads are easy travel to come up with baseline, baseline numbers. And I came up with a number of roughly uh, 50 miles of trekking if you're utilizing a horse and doing that in a day, or the same distance can be traveled in a week on foot. And the reasons for that are twofold. Number one is that a long adventure on foot shouldn't t should take you quite a distance, but it should also have a lot of pot potential encounters and engagements in it, especially in a very filled in very active world. You might walk a day before you find another farm, but once you find a farm, you probably find another one relatively closely. And therefore, it's just a matter of how you determine your encounters should go. And by using a general rule of 50 miles in a week on foot, 50 miles in a day by horse, you are able to give a sense of scale that for the locations between location and location so you'll know how long it's going to take for the local city to build uh, the local city that's wanting to give this village a difficult time how long it would take for them to get here how many uh, forces they're committing to what kind of duration in the encounter might be these all these little number of things will come over, come with come to to mind over time but the main thing is to realize is that by having a frame you know that walking seven miles is a long haul on foot. Yes, you might be able to finish it in less than three or four hours, but you also have to take into account uh, tear down time for your encampment or your your uh, camp your campsite. Then you got to worry about distance to travel. Then you got to consider finding the right nav right spot to camp for the next night, and so on. And so the Seven miles, you could probably walk more. You could definitely allow the players to ca to cover more distance. But you also have to take into account other things like the uh, difficulty of terrain, bad weather, the uh, state or condition of any roadways, 
if there are none then you've got to worry about the concept of how long it takes to do the reckoning and traveling is not a uh, pleasure cruise so to speak unless the world is ultra advanced generally speaking the terrain is generally rugged and you know the, the idea of taking uh, about seven miles per day just simply makes it a nice mathematic structure and that's what I utilize next okay I'm going to give you okay when I talk about time here I'm not speaking of time in game I'm talking about time mechanisms while you're storytelling and one of the biggest one of the biggest is getting the game going the actual start time and so one of the mechanisms the first of the three time tricks that I recommend is get getting and accessing a sand glass usually a, if you can find a an hour glass, they call them hour glasses but they might be a, a 10 minute timer or whatever if you get one that's got like a 15 minute that's optimal for beginning a session so the players have some opportunities to kibitz, carry some of the ideas of the story so far into that time period and therefore they're using that time to describe what they see as going on and what they want to include for the adventure from their standpoint. And also having the sand glasses is a great way to get players back on track. I have found that a five minute timer is usually optimal uh, you, of course, the egg timers in in games that give you a three minute window are, are perfectly fine. The, the, I guess they call those traditionally an egg timer. The idea of a three minute window, when the players see the clock go active, they start to assemble their ideas and cut short the the kibitzing to get back to the story because you're obviously focusing them with the the, the time clock. So a sand glass is a great time trick. I highly recommend that because it does tend to get people back on track. A second one is far easier to do and it's time honored. I think every game system recommends it. The game master simply opens whatever tome he's using for his narrative, picks up some dice and behind his shield starts to roll the dice. This is a secondary mechanism similar to the um, sand glass that gets the players back on track relatively quickly because nobody wants to be uh, not paying attention when the storyteller is rolling dice and such like. So by bringing them back around with the die rolling behind the screen is a great one. I don't tend to use that one mainly because I very rarely GM behind the screen any longer. It, it's got to the point where the world as it is, I've been GMing as I said, for a really long time. And so therefore, I know what's going on in any community. I know what the situations and the, the uh, conditions of the game might be. But having an idea of what those, what the players are thinking by utilizing the dice mechanism, you're able to bring them back online. Now, a third time trick, I think is really the most important. And the third time trick is that you need the players to feel the immediacy of the action. So as you're describing the scene and you're giving the full background, you want to make sure that you speak with a voice that represents the tempo and the excitement of what's going on right now it's because you want them really to be focused and paying attention in those really critical moments. And the reality is that every moment is critical in a role play game. You're wanting to definitely draw their attention by me changing your meter, changing your demeanor and your presence in the game gives the players an uns unseen concept of the importance of something. And so one way, of course, is to raise your voice and get excited and get, but that's, if you use that every single time, you're going to be defeating your very purpose of doing so. The idea, therefore, is that The, the idea, therefore, is that the timing mechanism 
should be based on metering. And of course, one of the ultimate time tricks is to be aware of where you are chronologically within a session. Because players, if, the, if you're playing at, a, at an intense level, aren't going to be looking at their watches or their phones to see what time it is. Instead, they're going to be depending on you to let them know. And one of the greatest effects that can be used to really affect the players session over session is the cliffhanger. Now, every session as a cliffhanger would be boring, just like never using a cliffhanger would be less interesting. So the idea is meter it out and use it ju uh, judiciously, but the idea of not only perhaps not even at the end of a session, maybe you cliffhanger earlier only to leave them hanging while you finish another part of the scene to bring them back before the end of the session. But the idea of utilizing time in game to affect the time outside of game is really, really important. So there I've covered my three time tricks. Now let's get on to the next point here. All right, the next part is the part of players. And it seems like we've gotten a long way to getting here. We're talking, you know, several points we've gotten to before we've gotten to the issue of players. But the reality is, is that as a storyteller, the players are absolutely critical to the story. But I'm talking about here the way that you can utilize your players to ease yourself into being a good game master, a great game master, because you depend on them so much. As I mentioned, having the players describe the our story so far, that beginning initial moments of the campaign of the game session are critical because then the players are getting to put in their perspective. Perhaps they like I said, they, they are focused on the combat scenes and so all they remember is what they fought last. Well, by utilizing the other pieces of this process, you've given them more to think about. You've given them other locations they might investigate. You've told them something about the community that they're in just simply by how you're reacting because you're playing the village or the town as a, as a character, so to speak. But the, the way that I'm referring to the part of players here is that the part of the players that, that the part that the player, players take in the game will amplify your effectiveness. So, for example, if there is a member of the party who has skills that would make them a good public speaker, then depend on them to be the one who speaks for the party. Does that, does that always work out? Probably not. And there are gonna be times when a person chooses that role that is really not suited to them individually, but the point is, is that role play is that you're playing a role. So if you are uh, listed as being a very expert map maker, I'm going to be depending on you to keep track of where things are. If you are a person who has, as I said, public speaking, you're out in front. If you have a character who's particularly wise, I'm always going to refer back to you in story, in game to fill in the, the morals of the story, so to speak the ethos that the players should be taking when they enter the village or town. And finally, the players are your barometer. If you're engaging with the players and they're all excited and interested, it's not difficult to depend on them. But sometimes they feel, you know, it may feel that they're a little bit out of touch with what's going on. But more importantly than that, I think one of the keys is that you need to have a way to handle the players in a just, equitable, and embracing and accepting way. One of the easiest here is a mechanism that I recently discovered on one of the ancillary products. There was a Game Master screen that came, and pop, came out that was very clever. It had the means of putting the character names as basically cards across the top of the screen and therefore you could adjust them in terms of 
uh, whether it be your initiative order or maybe it's just the order in which you call on the players for their actions or maybe it's their marching order that changes. All of these things can be uh, accomplished through a mechanical means that allows you to keep track of who's been playing and who has already interacted and who has not because it's really important that every player has a part to play in the story and by having some mechanism to remind yourself who's next who's next who's next whether you use a paper hard copy version or if you simply keep a small notepad or whatever that tracks it for the players the idea therefore is that you're able to keep the players involved keep the story moving and keep the player interaction isolated. I mention this also because the part of players is to tell you how they like to play. And that you might have, pardon my French, a Leroy Jenkins. You might have a, a murder hobo amongst the group. You may have an entire group that are dedicated to these kind of propositions. It's up to you as the game master to read from the players what it is they're engaging with, what they enjoy, and playing into that. Now, does that mean that every combat, every session needs to have a combat scene? Well, it is a monster killing game, generally speaking, when you're speaking of Dungeons and Dragons. If you're doing one shots, then certainly it'll be a lot of combat actions because that's part of being a character in a role play game. But it doesn't have to be exclusively or excessively so. And if you're playing on a campaign level, of course, the story will have ebbs and flows, high spots and low spots that the players will be playing into. And so it's important that you are calling back on the players. And the final thing I want to talk about when we talk about the players part, one of the biggest parts of being a good game master is being an exceptionally good listener. Players often won't even say anything directly to you, but their conversation with each other and with the NPCs in-game will give you tons of information that you can use to make your game sessions feel more accommodating and more real. This also feeds somewhat into the part of NPCs, and I've done an entire video. I'm going to put a link to it up here, right there, or right there. I don't remember one of the sites making marks here so so that I'll be able to find it later but I want to be able to put up the uh, various forms of non-player characters so that you can see that there's a whole variety of them and they really need to be treated like players in that they also have an agenda now the issue of scaling maybe a town's numbers will never become known to your players they're really for your development and your understanding of how the play works but by having the idea of the players acting at the, the non-player characters playing as part of the story and they are part uh, they have as much of a role to play as the players do then you're giving and taking from the players uh, as well alrighty we're coming coming up on the culmination here just Oh, I got a couple more to go. Now, if you read the words I put on the screen, keys to prophecy, you may be thinking, I've gone off the deep end. Jonathan, you're going into a part of the world we don't want to go into, and that is religion. But the reality is here that prophecy literally just means a prognostication. In the case of players, there's nothing that gets a charge out of the players than the realization that something they're doing falls into line with the tropic course of your campaign or your story. The idea here, therefore, is you need to be able to learn the key, the keys, I should say, to prophecy because there's more than one. If you're going to be developing a story that has long tail, you're running a series of adventures, Certainly you want the players to feel like they're part of something and one of the greatest ways to do so is to establish for them a future 
that may or may not happen depending on what they do. Now, this plays both ways. There are times when you want the prophecy to fail and therefore the players have subverted and averted some horrible danger that might have come. You're wanting to give them the opportunity to make changes in the, in the universe that are felt. Not only within their time frame, but perhaps in the, t the, the time frame of the world. And giving this kind of power to a player by giving them a prophecy that includes nothing about them, this brings them directly to attention and they will pay attention to the story. If nothing else, at least to find a way to break the prophecy. And there are some keys to this. The first one is follow the, follow the concepts of, of Nostradamus. Most people that know the story of Nostradamus know that he built a lot of prognostications that, according to some, have happened not once or twice in, their, in, in real time, but over the global scale of humanity many times. To the point where there are people who still will ascribe to the works of Nostradamus or Confucius or whatever, all of the different persons who provided prophetic visions throughout time, and they try to establish an actual timeline and how they would actually work. The key to a uh, being a prophet, therefore, in these kinds of terms, is to be as general as possible and giving uh, specific keys and clues only to the places where it serves your purposes as a storyteller to get the players to progress. Uh, one of the great examples I can give is that there was a young player who was very impetuous when he first started. He was a teenager. He hadn't developed any idea of longevity and had been playing somewhat of a, a YOLO kind of a personality. But he wanted very much to be a part of the story of the world. And so I made a prophecy and de de dedicated it to him that he would find himself standing over the bodies of all of his teammates and it would be up to him to save them all. And he had to, you know, in that prophecy, he would have to make the decision whether he was a moral, upstanding, and righteous fellow or if he was as capricious and dark as he had been portraying. The funny thing was is that the very concept of the prophecy shook him a bit because he didn't realize that a story could mean him personally. He had always looked at the idea of being a part of a story as being something that everybody just did and it was a like a video game you push the pieces around on the board and at the end of the session you put them all back in a box and you were done but now with a prophecy hanging over his head that warned of something like this he started to be more hyper diligent about not only what he was doing but what was going on with the rest of the group which fit directly into what I was trying to get from him you see by giving him a prophecy and warning him of the outcome, it put him in a position where he had to, had to constantly be checking his actions against what might be. And as it turned out, there was a situation in-game which was sort of inevitable given a capricious attitude as he had, where he was indeed the last person standing. The rest of the group had fallen into magical effects or poison or whatever and it, it, he was literally the last the last one standing and you should have seen this jaw drop because it was at that moment that one of the other players quoted the prophecy to him he had literally let it slip from his mind because it had been so long since the prophecy had been made that he'd forgotten and he was on his way to doing very capricious things and all of a sudden someone brought out the actual words of the prophecy he was stunned. As a player, he, he shook his head and looked at me and he said, you knew this? You knew this was going to happen? I don't know how you knew that. That's amazing. Well, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. He was going to do that if he continued to follow his original path, which he had fallen back into. So it made the prophecy strong because it was general and non-specific and it didn't say when it was going to happen it simply was going to be something that occurred and therefore 
by focusing on that, he helped the prophecy to become fulfilled. The second key to prophecy, in addition to being as ambiguous as possible, is be as curiously specific as you can be. But this can be arbitrary. For example, if you say that such and such is going to happen at the rising of the moon, well, which rising of the moon? Is it this month or next month or three months from now? You just specified that it's going to happen at the rising of the moon. Mm, another possibility is you could say something about it's going to happen in the valley with the dragon. <laughs> well, there are literally a million ways that can be interpreted. It could be that there's a dragon alive in the area. There could have been a dragon that was the controller of the area at some point in the past. Perhaps there's a person whose family crest is a dragon. There's millions of ways for it to be fulfilled. And each generalization you put in, you want to make it as poignantly specific so that the players will fill in the gaps and attach the pieces and make two plus two equal four. By doing this with your prophecies, you're giving the players agency to interpret. And going back to what we talked about before, the idea of a yes and, sometimes their interpretation of the prophecy is even better than what you had in mind. So just be open to those possibilities because when they actually happen, then you get the benefit of being seen as you know, a genius and a fortune teller. And then the third thing about prophecy is realize that some of them are doomed to fail. So even if everything goes the way you intended it to go, but the players make a mistake or aren't in the right place or take a different attitude, any one of them could cause the prophecy to fail and therefore the prophecy then becomes a foil for the players to interact with because they can go, aha, it didn't happen that way only to set up for a later occurrence of the prophecy when things are more in line with it. So the idea, therefore, is that the concept of prophecy is a dynamic that you can use, but just realize that there are keys to making it work effectively, and you should try to use those. Alrighty, so now we come to the unasked question. Now, I normally would leave this to my viewers to come up with, and if strictly if you're with us still and you've got an idea of what you believe the unasked question would be, I'd love to hear from you. If not, I will uh, eventually get to mentioning it here in a second. But about what about the question what what do you believe the unasked question would be given what I've given so far I'm trying to give away the farm here I'm trying to give everything that a player could use to make their game uh, dynamic and last as long as my 50 year campaigns have gone so I just was asking whether you have an idea of what you think might be the unasked question and Silence from the gallery. That's okay. The unasked question simply is this. Why have I done this? Why would somebody spend 50 years of storytelling? Why would someone at, at this point in my life be running seven, eight, nine campaign sessions a week? Why would you do that? And the reality is, is that Everything that I talk about, all the good stuff, and we're going to go back and I'm going to highlight them all here again in a second, but every one of the points of my list here are what I use in my everyday life for everything. It, it, it doesn't matter how you look at it. All of it really plays in to a real life That one I didn't need to come back on. 
So I'll give you some examples. Life continues on and on and on, right? Our story so far is always the beginning of every day. When we wake up in the morning, it's what's our story for today? What what's, what was important yesterday? What are we going to be continuing on with it in the future? Uh, the idea of developing a means of reminding myself what's important is key and critical. And so a story so far is literally how I begin my days. I may eventually have enough time in my life to be doing videos at, at every stage of this. But the idea is that you get up in the morning and you say, okay, what's our story so far? How are we on these things? And I've got a pile of objectives that are, you know, increasing over time as I get more excited about the launch pad and the idea of utilizing the creativity that I develop in fantasy role play in actual live action, actual life itself. Uh, the idea of continuity. What we do today does stack on what we did yesterday and developing the concept of the domino principle established, you know, established for the launch pad actually started with con the concept of campaign continuity. You want to keep your story moving on towards its logical conclusion. It's just that you have to develop what that logical conclusion is going to be far in advance of achieving it because that is how the mind works and it's how reality works. Uh, concept of scale. What you do, um, a, a great example is my dad used to always say, how do you eat an elephant? And the joke is, of course, one bite at a time. You have to start someplace and you have to continue. So the idea of being able to scale your actions from a one-person action to a 10-person campaign to 100 people in an audience, you know, to 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever the, your, your cho chosen target would be. But the idea is that your scale has to also be able to be measurable and understandable. And by realizing that, it's a easier to take apart the difficult tasks and re redefine them in a way that they become easier to handle because there are scalar comparisons at every step of the road. As far as navigation, yes, we all have an objective. And my friend, the, the idea here in games is make it as simple for your players as possible to find their way around. But that's also for us as well. When we are looking at things in terms of navigation, we want to go forward, but we don't always know what that forward looks like. So by coming up with at least an idea of what the next steps would be and progressing towards them, it becomes easier to do. Time tricks. Biggest problems that we have in our world are uh, procrastination in many cases. And I have to say that uh, most people are amateur procrastinators. They're not necessarily procrastinators because trust me, as a procrastinator, I know how to put stuff off. So the real trick there is that the time tricks that I referred to in game that drive players forward can also be used on yourself. You can actually set things like timers and clocks to, to goad you into doing the, the, what needs to be done in a timely fashion and thereby continuing to advance on your own score. Um, yes, yes. And I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. To. <laughs> he says, "Stop calling me out." Yeah, you're the only one in the chat. So there. Ah. but um. So no, the the I just was asking what you think the un unasked question is. I, I I will I will get back around to it here in a second. But the idea is that now what works for your games can also work for life. Uh, players, everybody in the world is a player. We are all engaged in some form of interaction, and that interaction is by definition a kind of a game. You need to have an idea of what that means and recognize all of the players are important. You need to have time for everybody and work out how you're going to meet it out to get the best benefit for everyone involved. The, the concept of prophecy has to do with your own future. What is it you envision for yourself? Where, where do you see yourself going? 
in what ways are you advancing towards those? And by developing your own concept of self-fulfilling prophecy, you can therefore navigate forward the direction you want to go through building your own uh, prophetic statements and then making them come true. So now the real, co the real unanswered or the unasked question is just this. Why? Why do you do it? I love it. it this is who I am. This is what I do. A, I have always, whether I've been an air traffic controller or a microwave antenna installer, whether I've been a truck uh, owner of a truck, uh, owning a truck, trucking company, or been a lawnmower, I've done all kinds of different op occupations. But in all of them, I'm still me, and the me I am has been a storyteller and game master, and this is what I do. So the unasked question of why? Because I love it. Because is this is what I'm here to do. Now I want to thank you for spending some time with me today. This has been really uh, important for me to actually share with you the meat and potatoes of what you need to know to be a game master. This is the short version, and I think that I actually got in right at an hour. So... <laughs> and so I, 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 if you want to know more about what I'm doing what the world is check out patreon.com slash Nikos and if you want to know more about the property check out www.nikosrpg.com uh, if you want to know more about the lore that's uh, nikos.info nikosrpg.info and I'm going to put up the, uh, what I call the closing page here in a second. So there, you got all of those notes there. The Discord is listed below. Um, I, I'm, going to, I'm eventually going to get the uh, bot set up. So I'm going to put it into the, the chat here so you can find it that way as well. But until those times, I want to thank you for your time staying with us today in this video. If you like what you see, follow us here on which we're, we're on generally every night and if you at 11 p.m. every night and we also do live streaming games on Saturday there's more information on that thank you very much and um, we also have additional games at a game store here in Southern California so if you happen to be in the Redlands area Board Game Paradise is the place for that Mondays and Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific. And gosh, there's so much more I want to share and so much more I want to get to, but I'm really glad that you've had, you spent this time with me today. 